What I wanted to do today was just by way of background, I spent the first 15 years of my career working in corporate life. So I worked, started working with IBM, worked with IBM for a few years, Xerox for a few years, Gulf Oil out in Calgary for uh, two or three years. Then I was vice president of HR for Nortel back in the late 80s when we were in high growth mode. Started a consulting firm, took it public, uh, worked that for a while, started a, co a coaching company back in, uh, ran a software company in 2000 for a couple of years. So I've got a lot of experience and I do a lot of work on board louder. governance. A bit louder. Okay, a little louder? Please. Okay. I do a lot of work on board governance. I do a lot of work uh, post-merger with companies as they're going through uh, trying to revamp their, their strategies, etc. So what I want to do today is I really want to talk about what you need to do to become agile, how you need to behave to become agile, what kind of leadership you need, etc. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first of all start about what's What's driving the need for agility? Because agility is one of those words that you can drive a truck through. It's, it's very commonly used. People think about it and they think, oh, we're going to go agile. Well, there actually is a history to it. There's a meaning to it. And it's a very important meaning to understand. The second thing I want to talk about are what factors and mindsets are holding us back from that. And you might be surprised at some of those mindsets. The ones that if I, if I said to you what's happening or what's preventing you from becoming Agile, people might say, well, mindset, it might be we have the wrong leadership, it might be we don't have enough resources, we don't have enough time. There are all kinds of things that come in the way of becoming agile. I want to also talk about and touch on how do we need to think as individuals and as leaders to accelerate and to create and reinforce the right mindsets. And so everybody in here is either an existing leader, an emerging leader, somebody who is, who is going to take things to the next level. That's why you're here. And the last thing I want to talk about is how can HR take advantage of the inflection point and become a catalyst of change? So those are the topics. So, and then lastly, we want to talk about the, la the steps that we can take immediately. I want to leave you with things that you can actually go to tomorrow and actually start to move on this journey towards agility. So the first thing I want to do and before I give a speech on anything like this, I usually go to the dictionary. I was an honors English grad, so that's my go-to. And I found out that Agile started as a software. Well, when I was at, at uh, uh, a uh, software company running it for a couple of years, we were adopting the word Agile. And what Agile does is it actually is a process that is used to develop software. And it replaced a process called Waterfall, which was traditional and very linear. Okay, so Agile is a continuously exper experimental, collaborative, iterative process that really looks like this. So if you're waterfall, you start with an idea saying, I think I have an idea, let's build it, let's test it, let's move it through the, through the waterfall process. And that's a very linear project. So let's take, for example, back in 30, 40 years ago, if Ford Motor Company were, was manufacturing a car, they would manufacture the car and then they would have quality control at the very end of the process. And if you found something in that car that was done way back at the beginning, you'd have to re-engineer re it to go backwards. Toyota decided that's not the way we do that. What we want to do is we want to empower all of our employees on the production line to stop the production line without recourse if they saw something going on. That enabled them to correct in real time. The difference between one the Ford Motor Company approach, which was waterfall, let's get everything done and then we'll see whether it works, versus the agile process, which is what catapulted Toyota to number one in the world automotive industry. So what is agile? Agile is really comes from, from two words. So if you look it up in the dictionary, the first word will be creativity. And what is creativity in agile? Creativity is the ability to think and understand quickly. How do you process information in a very expeditious way. And as you know, in today's world, we are flooded with information. We're flooded with ideas, etc. So what it is, it's the human capacity to outthink our competitors. So when you look at business, what ad, ad, the reason you're going to be agile is because you want to outthink your competitors. The second thing is you've got to move quickly. If you ask somebody what's agile mean, that means you're flexible, you're, you can move around, you can move quickly. And what that reflects in an organizational sense is the capacity of an organization through its processes, through its decision making, 
through its motivation to move quick, more quickly than uh, its competitors. The one thing that is missing from that definition in an organizational sense, if you want to move to the idea of agility, is leadership behavior. What is it that leaders have to do differently to create an agile environment? And so leadership behavior is the ability of all the leaders at all levels in your organization, whether that's the board of directors through the C-suite right down to the first level, for all leaders to embrace the values, the mindsets, and the behaviors that create the space for agile thinking. They're not going to come up with the answers, but what they can do is they can create the space for flexibility of thinking, for ideas, et cetera, et cetera, and for taking action. You'll notice that the formula is creativity plus speed. Those are the two essential ingredients that you have to create within your organization. But you'll notice that it's multiplied by leadership behavior. Because if you have a bad leader or a toxic leader, you can be the most creative, you can have the best speed, the best processes, but if you have a leader that does not create the space, everything is like multiplication by zero. Everything becomes zero. So you neutralize your ability to move. So if you are going to embrace agility and you want to become a more flexible, fast-moving company with new ideas, innovation, and the like as your attributes, you have to figure out where you start, which is the diagnostic phase. So any, any consulting assignment, and I've been a consultant for a long time, as, as Pauline said, in any consulting assignment, there's a diagnostic phase, there is a solution design phase, and then there's embedding the solution or implementing the solution phase. And what most companies do is they spend a lot of time with the idea. I've got a product I want to sell. I've got the design. I've got the solution. And so if you had $10 to spend, I've observed most companies spend maybe a couple of bucks here. They'll spend six bucks in the middle in the design and tweaking the, all the features. And then they'll spend another two bucks on the implementation. In my world, the complete inverse is exactly what you should be doing you should be spending $4 in the diagnostic phase. Because if you do the right diagnostic, the design will fall out. So the diagnostic is about reassessing what you've got and reflecting as to why you got there, why you have it, what it's doing for you, etc. Then you spend, if you've spent, if you've done the right diagnostic, the solution design will start to emerge from that. Okay, so that's where your $4 here, you spend two bucks there, and then you spend the rest of your budget in embedding that. And I didn't use the word implementation, I didn't use it consciously, because implementation is seen as a mechanical, sequential event. What we really need to do if we're going to move to this mindset of agility is we need to embed it in the behaviors as well as the processes that we have in organizations. So if you're going to do this, the first thing that you need to do is you, because you're going to be talking to an entire organization, you need to set some guiding principles. What do we mean? What are we going to try to do with this notion of agility? You have to help define and create a thinking organization. And you have to develop the ability to distill complexity and chaos into clarity and causality. So as an HR professional, you're not tasked with simply saying, oh my god, this is really complex and it's chaotic and I'm really very empathetic. What you really need to be exploring is what is causing this? Because if you don't deal with the root cause, you'll never be able to move forward. And the, the old adage, if you always did what you always have done, you'll always get what you always got. So if you want to move forward, you've got to move forward. But causality, I think, is one of the key elements of diagnostic. So if you go to a doctor, and the doctor says, well, you've got X, what you want to know is, what am I doing in my life to cause X? Causality is everything. So understanding causality will give you the map that will allow you to move to agility. So, when we look at an, ecos an organization as a whole, it's an ecosystem. So you see a tree, you're driving down the street. This is what you see of an organization. You see, I guess I got the control here. <laughs> this is what you visibly see and this is what you visibly experience. So when you look at a corporation, you look at their financial report, you can go to Bloomberg, you can go look at it every day. You look at their financial performance. You look at their brand reputation. You see how they advertise, what they're trying to convey in terms of the reliability, et cetera, et cetera. You look at their operating efficiencies and compare that to your competitors. And you look at the quality of your products and whether those products are sustainable. So what you get from all of those things is you build public trust, you build a reputation, a brand, you build customer trust, 
you, invest, you in, develop investor trust, and you develop value. And that's great, that's what you see. But then the question is, going back to the word causality, is what's, what feeds that? Without having a root system, you don't have anything, right? You have no nutrient that's coming in here. So you need a root system in any organization. So what you don't see in organizations are things like the invisible and experienced. It all starts at the bottom. Where the food comes into the nutrient system and through this is through the values of an organization. If you set the values and you articulate the values in an appropriate way, that the things that you want, they will create mindsets. Leaders will adopt mindset. When I worked with IBM uh, back in, they started there in 1975, you walk in the front door, the first word that I saw was the word think. The next words were respect for the individual, pursuit of excellence, and service to the customer. That was the mindset that you were taught from the day that you walked in. That was the value. That created a mindset in leadership whereby they said, in our world, managers are culture. They're synonymous. They are the couriers of culture. So if you have the right mindsets, or you have the right values, it will create the right leadership mindsets. That and subsequently creates the right behaviors. That allows people to create the space, reinforces the practices, the structures, and the patterns. These are the things that are in, invisible and, ex, and experienced by none other than employees, which is, doesn't seem to be, oh, I see how that's working. So this builds employee trust, okay? And everything in an organization, all of this is built on this. So values start everything. And I, I listened to the three presentations that were four presentations, and I can't tell you how many times the word value was, was portrayed. So, if you're sitting as an HR professional, you say, okay, I get all this stuff, but what perspectives do I need to take here? And so I, I look at it from a vertical hierarchical point of view. And I said, the company or the people who run your company and have a, let's call it an invisible hand on what's going on in your organization are your board of directors. And they're responsible for the long-term growth, risk management, sustainability, governance, and C-suite performance. Then your other constituent is the CEO. And what is the CEO's job? They define the values, they're responsible for multi-year performance, et cetera, et cetera, brand, organizational effectiveness. Then you've got your C-suite, and they're, they're focused. You'll notice the time spans seem to compress. Then you've got your leadership at all levels, and then you have what we call your emerging leaders who are your past, or your employees who are your past alumni, and that's what we forget a lot, uh, your current employees and your, the future talent. So as an HR practitioner and an HR executive, you are responsible for all of those constituents. That's five constituencies. Well, if you look at it a different way, and you say, okay, what are the people who are in, in that sort of board of directors, C-suite organization? A lot of those people are in the latter period of their careers. They are what we call legacy leaders, and their job is to impart wisdom and insights, take a, take a holistic perspective, to do a lot of listening, to enable, and to connect. Then you have, in your organization, the people who are in that middle management and C-suite, or a C-level executive, and they're usually established leaders. And their job is to really leverage their own learning. So if you're in your mid-career, that's what you're doing. You're trying to live your values, you're trying to leverage your relationships, develop strategic self-awareness, and then try to better yourself through strategic self-management. If you're an emerging leader, somebody who aspires to move into the leadership role in an organization, particularly in HR, your job is really to experiment, to ask questions, to embrace core values and your own core values, know what you're all about, build your own relationships, and start to develop self-awareness. So that's looking at the, the different roles. So now, if we look at it from a hierarchical point of view, you got your board down to your employees. Now, if you flip that on its side, what you'll find is that the people who are on your board grew up in a different world, okay? They grew up in a period, to sort of the 1960s to 1980s. So they're all in that thing. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to take a look at what was, what's driving their thinking? What are they, what's driving their mindset, right? So the, when you were, if you were a legacy leader who was in, 1960, or, you know, in that 60 to 80 period, 
your whole world was all about strategic planning, your product, you thought in 25 year terms, you were male dominated, you know, it was all position was power, you know, big offices, all that kind of stuff. You came out of World War II and the Depression, so that was your influencing factor. Your structures were very layered, hierarchy sil siloed, productivity was the guidepost, motivation was all about security and how long I leave and you get a gold watch at the end, and then technology was all mainframe computing. So that's a legacy leader. An established leader grew up in a different world. In 1980 or 81, they came out with the first personal computer. Up to that point, they didn't exist. First one was called the ThinkPad. Interesting, it came from IBM. So what, was, what, were, what were the drivers in that period of time? Pursuit of excellence. Somebody wrote in search of excellence. So everybody was going excellence. We need to be best practice. We need to follow that. What were the drivers? The capital was all about uh, financial performance. Oops, financial performance. The time horizon had shrunk from 25 year time horizons down to, let's think about 10 years because things are moving fast. We started to introduce in the 1980s, because I was involved in writing the white paper on pay equity in Ontario, we started thinking about equity. But equity in that world was male-female equity. Power had shifted from being positioned to sort of having, how do we leverage technology? Influence had moved from the depression, et cetera, et cetera, to a very financially volatile world. We had interest rates in 1980 that were 22 and percent. Everybody thinks interest rates are high now, trust me. Living in that world is different. The human dynamics were delayed. We started to delayer. I was VP of HR for Nortel. I took the organization from 14 layers of leaders down to eight layers of leaders. That was a major effort over, over a couple of years, and we had to change everything. But we started to delayer because we couldn't move fast enough. We couldn't develop. We couldn't make decisions fast enough. So we had to remove the impediments. And decision making was an impediment. So we focused in culture, we moved away from productivity to, to satisfaction. Motivation was not about security, it was all about interesting work. And then the PC and dot com world evolved. If you're an emerging leader, you're typically uh, influenced by the 2000 to 2020 period. And what happened in that 20 year period was trade was globalized. So we have you know, the European Union, et cetera, et cetera. The customer was made king our timeline started to shrink again, right? We said, you know, 10 years is a little long, things are pretty volatile, let's move down to a three-year time horizon. Instead of talking about equity, we started to talk about, introduce the concept of the diversity that went way beyond just male, female. We, the power position shifted from position to technology to all of a sudden information and data. Who's got the information, who's got the data? Digitization takes over, team-based and collaborative performance takes takes hold, engagement is the key word, buzzword for what, it, what do we want from employees and what employees want to do, what motivates them is mobility, finding another job. And we saw that in spades over the early periods. The question I have is what does the next 20 years look like? Where are we trying to go here? And what, how would we describe, so if you're entering the workforce now, how would you want to describe the organization that you want to work for? Would you describe it as saying, hey, I really want to work in a male-dominated, you know, a layered, siloed organization focused on productivity? Or would you rather say, I want to work in the world that we live in today. And today, we've shifted from trade globalization to talent globalization. We work with people through Zoom calls around the world every day. In terms of capital, it's no longer financial capital, customer capital. It's now social and intellectual capital. It's our ability to think. It's our ability to use data. The time horizon has moved from 25 years to 10 years. Now we're talking about things in real time. How do we make decisions? That's what agility is, is all about, is ability to make decisions in shorter periods and to, to, to be uh, flexible enough to move in real time. Your demographics have now shifted to, from diversity, and now we're using the word inclusivity. We don't want to sort of count people the number of X's and Y's and Z's, we want everybody to be inclusive. So the social dynamics are all about knowledge and insight. How do you distill what you hear from AI or what you have from AI? The influence, as Pauline introduced, will be the pandemic. The pandemic is an inflection point. It caused us to prove to ourselves that we can be agile. 
organizations have proven it. So they don't have to go backwards and say, oh, how do we do this? They've actually done it. So the human dynamics, we've gone from, uh, from structured, layered organizations, siloed, and now we are what we call networked organizations. Culture is not about productivity, satisfaction, it's about enrichment and experience. Motivation is all about self-reliance and well-being, and technology is all about data and AI. So the next 20 years, the future leaders are going to work in that environment. And our job as HR leaders is to equip those leaders to work effectively and to create the space where they can actually apply these things. So when you think about, a, so just to go back to this slide for a moment. So what I'm trying to convey here is this is your board of directors right here, okay? The people who are sort of 60 to 70 years old, they're the ones that are making decisions, they're the ones that are sitting there. I sat on the board of Bank of America for 15 years. I can tell you that it's male dominated, it's opinionated as hell, and it's all built on the past. It's not built on the future. So your established leaders, this is your C-suite here. These are your middle managers, and these are the people who are, this is your alpha and uh, your alpha generation and your Gen Z that's coming into the workforce right now. So this is the environment that we need to create. So when you're dealing with a multi-generational organization, and oh, by the way, every person in this room will move from being at this end of the spectrum, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years from now, you'll be here. Okay, so think about <laughs> the influences will change, but you will be moving along a horizontal timeline. So dealing with a multi-generational organization is about don't assume anything. Don't give in to what we call a generational generation. All baby boomers are like this, or all Gen Xs are like that. Don't give in to that. It really comes down to stop labeling, start to find some new language that reflects learning. It is not ageist related. Check your biases, pay attention to the people, not the trends, not the narrative. Every individual, I can tell you I've got people who are fr friends of mine who are baby boomers who are Luddites, and I've got people who are extremely inspirational. I've got people who are, you know, Gen Zs who are inspirational, and some are want to just, you know, they just want to stay in their job. So embrace the, in the diversity of every generation. So, what I really want to do here is to start talking about how, as an HR professional, you can start to be a catalyst of change. I didn't say an agent of change, and I didn't say that consciously, because the word agent of change implies that you own the change. Okay, a catalyst of change implies that there are things that you can do as an HR leader that can help others, other leaders, other organizational units to do things. So the first thing to do as an HR person is to get out, your, get out of your HR box, okay? Think of things from a 360 point of view. You have to think about it from a business point of view. Why are we doing it? Why do we need to be agile? Why do we need to move faster? Everything seems to be going right now. Think about what is driving your business, what's the competitive environment? And from that, from the business strategy, emerges an organizational strategy. If you want to grow, you have to reinforce growing through performance or through uh, pay systems or whatever. So think of it, and then the third component is looking at it both from a leadership point of view in terms of the leadership system and yourself as a leader, reflect on that. The second thing that you can do is to develop new gener next generation thinking and language. So when you go back to that chart where I talked about the years, the years that influence, think about using the terms on the far right as descriptors of the organization as opposed to the tendency. And we are in a point now where Everything is sort of uncertain. People really do want to go back to normal, right? There's a real push to go to back to normal. So we have to be very diligent in pushing forward to that next generation thinking. When you want to, be, when you want to catalyze change or you want to become agile, find opportunities, small opportunities that you can start to, to experiment with and to, to, uh, to work with. Mental health and well-being is absolutely critical. If you don't have a mentally healthy organization, you're going to be dysfunctional, you'll have toxicity, etc. So one of the other things that you need to do is make sure that those spaces are created in a healthy way. When you find friction points, when you find resistances, try to remove them, try to mitigate them, lessen. I will tell you, most of the work that I do in rapid alignment is strategic post-merger integration work, etc. Nine times out of ten, we will find 
that there is some individual whose attitudes and whose behavior, whatever it happens to be, is an impediment to moving forward. One person. I, I was painting the other day. I do painting. And I took a, I had a pool of white paint. And I dropped one dot of black into that little pool of white paint. And that whole pool became gray. The, the effect of a toxic leader or a leader that, that leads in the wrong way can be insidious in an organization. So we need to be open, we need to identify, and we need to mitigate. We need to implement high involvement idea programs. So for example, when I say that, suggestion programs. So one of the things that I did uh, when I was on the board of MBNA Bank was they have a suggestion program. And I was talking to the CEO one day. He was coming up to Toronto to uh, present the Masterpiece Award, which was for the best idea. So I said to him, I said, Rick, how many, what percentage of the population participate in the idea program? He says, well, in Canada, we have about 75%. I said, you have 75% of your population who participates in a suggestion program? He goes, yeah. I said, he goes, but we're new in Canada. We've got lots of opportunity. I said, well, you've been in the US for you know, 30 years. I said, what, what's your experience? And well, you have 65%. I said, OK, you've got to tell me why, because I do this for a living. I said, I don't see this kind of participation. Like, Anyway, he says, well, the reason is because we have a process. Every Tuesday, we all managers at 4 o'clock meet, and they talk about all the ideas that have been submitted that week. And in that one-hour meeting, those managers will say, you know what, that's a good idea. Oh, by the way, Sally, I'd like you to work with me on that. They might say, you know what, I need you to go back and do some more work and figure out a little bit more, or here's why, here's why that idea won't work and give them a rationale. He says it's that cycle of feeding back and forth and that immediacy and the predictability of that cycle that makes that system work. Other things that you can do easily. Put together a program around critical questioning, critical thinking. Like that, you can, there are programs that you can bring in that test and challenge people to think differently than they have in the past. Leverage the power of data uh, analytics and pred predictability. That, uh, I think everybody who's working in the world of, uh, of AI understands the power that AI can have. And last but not least is revisit and realign your performance system and your subsequent reward system to ensure that they're aligned with these things. If you want to change, the, if you want to change an organization, put the word agility into everybody's performance contract. Just put that one word in there, and I guarantee you, you will create an environment where people will say, what does that mean? How do I do that? What do I have to do to be agile? What do I have to do? So use the performance system to leverage these things. So, so this is really just a bit of a philosophy around how to approach it. When I worked for Xerox, and this is in the early 80s, we had a, a, a VP of HR who came in, and he said, as HR professionals, you are all, yeah, okay, yeah. I'm, I only have two slides left. As HR professionals, you are consultants, okay? So you have to go out, you, you can provide services, but you are actually diagnosticians. And so he took us all off, off site and for three days and taught us how to be consultants. So here are some of the guidelines that came out of this. Always start where the client is, okay? So you have to figure out, when I talked about causality before, that's what you, as a consultant, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to solve for that. The second is you cannot want it more than your client. You might have the best idea in the world, you might only, but you can't want it more than they do. So you have to build that business case. The third, start small and build momentum. There are so many initiatives that we want to put in place that are huge and monumental and we're going to do it across. We're going to sheep dip everybody in the organization and the agility program. Here we go. No. Start small, find some place and then use that case study to build momentum. Identify and mitigate any resistances, as I, as I said before. But at the underpinning of everything is leadership behavior is the principal catalyst of change. If you feel comfortable of taking a risk, putting an idea forward, you will become a catalyst of change. The other thing that I, I really want to put forward here is HR people, we are very empathetic people. That's just the nature of what we do. We deal with the, the emotions of an organization. And so what we do is we give into empathy too easily sometimes. So we need, to, uh, we need to balance that with objectivity. 
So what I'm challenging each of you to do, when you have a conversation with a client or a person who wants to embark on whatever it is, whether it's agility or anything, ask three levels of question. What is the problem and or the opportunity? What is the evidence and the impact? And then what does success look like? Get them to envision that in their own mind. But you have to stay with the question, because if you just stay with question, you're, you're looking at their interpretation of the question as opposed to what the question might actually be. In the year 2000, I started a, an initiative called the Organization of the Future. And what I was really trying to do was to uh, engage people in conversations, not of the workplace of the future, but how organizations need to function, how they need to think about themselves. We did that, uh, we reprised it last year, and David Grillman and I did uh, a virtual symposium with 50 people from 26 countries around the world in virtual reality. So basically, it's like Zoom but you're all in the same room, it's a conference-like environment. What we are going to start doing in June is we're going to start hosting these again on a regular basis. But what we're going to do is we're going to create them as multi-generational conversations. So in each conversation, we're going to have representatives of all of those generations that we talked about earlier. And each group will have 25 participants that will be broken into groups of five, the groups of five will have people from each different generation. We're going to start the conversation not with the baby boomer. We're going to start the conversation with the alpha generation. We're going to allow them to talk and the other people to listen. As I said in my slide, the role of a board of directors or a person at the C-suite is to listen and then impart your wisdom. Okay? So as participants in this, you'll have an invitation to participate in this. I really want to encourage young people to participate. So students that you have, people who are on your staff in the HR group, I'd really like to encourage them to participate in because we are trying to create their future. So think about this, does everybody understand YPO, Young Presidents Organization, right? People belong, think about this as being the YPO for HR professions.